Good afternoon, I'm Rita Chelly. This is Ontario Today. In this hour... I think the AR has got a bad reputation because it looks like a military weapon, and in fact, it was originally designed to be a military weapon. The AR-15, the Armalite rifle, it's a trademark owned by Colt. There are also a wide number of nearly identical guns with other names. All of them under scrutiny again. Versions of this rifle used by the shooter in Florida, at the movie theater in Colorado, at the elementary school in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. People kill people. Guns don't kill people. So, and I firmly believe that. Why own a military-style assault weapon? one 817 While they may look scary, they pose no greater threat than any normal semi-automatic hunting rifle. Certainly no more powerful than a common hunting rifle or your grandfather's duck gun. Our guest, criminal defense lawyer Solomon Friedman. Firearms like this are used uh, all over the country, such as hunting, pest and varmint control, target shooting, recreation. They are commonly owned firearms, and they're used safely by Canadians hundreds if not thousands of times a day. Solomon Friedman is a unique bundle of expertise on firearms and Canada's gun laws. He not only defends alleged gangsters, but also, as he puts it, law-abiding gun owners who may commit paperwork crimes. He himself is a sportsman and target shooter. He likes guns. Why own a military-style assault weapon? Some of you are cringing at that question. Others are saying, yeah, I want to know. Let's try to narrow the distance between those two points. one 817 8995 Canada may be worlds apart from the U.S. when it comes to guns and the scale of tragedies, but there is still a canyon between those who own guns and those who don't. The only neutral space, it seems, when both sides agree to be polite, perhaps about hunting. Even that might be fake. If you own an AR-15 or similar rifles, why? What do you use it for? How do you explain it to people who already don't get guns? In the last few days, in anticipation of this discussion, I've had three private conversations with gun owners. Here's the thesis that emerges. None tell other people exactly what they own, a variety of reasons. All are frustrated that people who don't have gun literacy seem to condemn all firearms. And... They have also done some soul-searching, genuinely shaken by what is happening south of the border. They buy guns, like deranged killers buy guns. They don't like the company. On Parliament Hill, by the way, a Conservative backbencher introduced a petition to make the AR-15 a non-restricted firearm. That was before the Orlando shooting. Our guest, the lawyer, thinks it's still a logical move and he will explain why. Our question is for everyone, for gun owners and those of you who don't want one ever. Why own a military-style assault rifle? one 817 in this hour of Ontario Today. So I can tell you that the phone lines are very busy. If you're trying to get through, be patient. We have one person picking up the phone lines, and uh, we do want to include as many voices as we can. In fact, before we go to our studio guest, just a couple of quick comments, just to get a sense. Again, the phone lines are flooded right now. Jamie, you're in Nepean. What is it? How do you answer this question? Okay, well, first let me preface this by saying that I have good friends who are farmers and hunters. I have a brother-in-law who hunts avidly. And he uses all manner of uh, hunting. He does crossbow and black powder and all those, those types of things. And I have a good farmer friend who owns cattle, and he has to shoot coyotes because they hunt his cattle, wolves and coyotes, actually. And he also uses a rifle to make sure that he protects his cattle. So I'm not against the use of rifles for the utilitarian purposes. I know they exist. But the AR-15 is uh, a, is a firearm that fires a rapid cyclic rate and it can be uh, modified very easily for mass killings. And my belief is that there's only two reasons to have this weapon. One is to fight in a, in a just war somewhere uh, for you know, your country or for whatever the reason is, and the other is a mass killing because um, 
in, a, in an agricultural setting, you can use uh, much uh, simpler uh, uh, firearms with uh, much lower uh, reload rate and capacity. Because the reality is, once you fire the first shot, whatever the critter is, if you didn't hit it, the critter is, is basically gone. He's taken off. If you're and if you're firing uh, rapid rounds at a critter on your farm, you're firing irresponsibly. So let me ask you and two quick things. that's a crazy things. irresponsible thing to do. Let me and ask I just Jamie? disagree 100% with that. Okay, so when you say, you know, I, I, I'm going to challenge you on this because I know someone would, and I, I'm going to go to someone who actually I think owns one right after you. Um, just a second. Are you putting me on hold, <laughs> Jamie? Are no, you there? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> okay, so um, when you talk about for war, uh, th- this is problematic for anyone who knows this because, of course, it is designed. I mean, I know it can sound like an oxymoron, but a civilian uh, weapon. Uh, it's modeled on the M16, which is well, for that, war. So I understand. I understand that that assertion, but the problem with that is that uh, General Stanley, I believe it was General Stanley McChrystal, said that his troops would give their eye teeth to have a firearm that accurate and that powerful. And those are combat troops. That's a, that's a, that's a seasoned general. And he described the Air 15 as a very war-ready device. You know, you gave us all this context about your friends, your brother-in-law. Do they agree with you, or do you argue about the AR-15 and similar uh, my weapon. brother-in-law isn't asking for an AR-15, and my farmer friend is not asking for an AR-15 either. I think the serious people who actually use these these guns for real purposes and not shooting tin cans and not feeling very, you know, compensating for uh, whatever insecurities that they have, I think those people don't need them and they don't want them. Okay, I'm not. I, I, the rebuttal. The, I know the the defense lawyer is is dying to do this. I'm going to let Matt have, a, have perhaps what will sure. amount to a, a rebuttal. Matt, you're on the line in London. Do you own one? Uh, yeah, um, between me and my brother, we have three of them. Um, but my thing is, is it's it's actually it's a two two three round. So I'm gonna throw numbers at you, would probably blow you away. But anyway, um, what it means is uh, it, it's a small capacity round. Um, and yes, it is a semi-auto. But my two seventy, that's a semi-auto, is actually a larger capacity. Um, it can go further. It's a heavier bullet and creates a lar- can take down a larger target. Um, something you'd use to take down a moose. Um, a moose is a lot bigger than a human. Um, it, um, the AR-15s in Canada are pinned at five. That means they can only shoot five rounds. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you got to change the clip. My 270, same thing. So to me, what makes me um, kind of upset? Yes, my 270 is a wood stock. Looks like an old gun. This one here is black. Okay, so then I always joke, are you racist against my gun? Because, yes, it looks intimidating, but actually my 270, what is legit, and I can use to hunt coyote anywhere in Ontario, um, even down here in the south, um, is actually a far more powerful weapon. And this is what starts to fluster, like get us flustered, whereas down in the States, and I agree, um, down in the States, most of them come with a 30-round clip. What is what our officers generally carry up here, and you can buy hundred round drums. Okay, so you think, um, I want to ask you a couple of things because you're saying a lot, and I yeah. it, it, and also to clarify, uh, the AR-15 is legitimate. You just need to have a it's a, a restri- restricted license. Right. Okay, so yeah, to make that clear, it's a, you go through an extra hoop to have a restricted firearm. Um, is, let me ask you, why do you own it? Like when you say take down a bigger target, like what do you use it for? Is you just like um, the AR-15 is literally you can only use at a, at a shooting range. Um, when I go moose hunting or deer hunting up north, I use my 270 because um, it's you need need a, um, a lot more firepower and a lot more weight behind the bullet to actually penetrate the animal. Okay, so you don't um, like it. It makes a more ethical kill, so you can do a one shot, one kill. Versus if I had to shoot it with a two, two, three, I'd have to empty probably two clips into a moose to make a drop. So can I ask you, because I mean, someone might be thinking target shooting. Why couldn't you just go to a range and, you know, <clears throat> use what was ever there? You don't need to have one of these in your house, you know, takes a, you know, fewer of them in circulation. Like, I mean, um, is there a pride to having it? it there, there's a little bit. I mean, it's just like people own, why do people own Porsches or why do they own Ferraris? I mean, speed, speed limit's set at 100. I don't, I don't collect cars. I'd rather drive a beater. Um, the, the main thing for me, um, and this is where I think the difference is, is when what a lot of firearms owners would agree with is clip capacity. Because if you take away the capacity 
And I do not think that anybody should have a 30-round clip or a 100-round drum. Okay, but tell me the truth, because everybody I've talked to, and and you probably know this too, says a drill and 30 seconds, and it's changed. Yeah, well, I don't, and this is where I think the clip should be made to fit five rounds exactly. No, no um, pins. Okay. Like, and right now we have it pinned, and I disagree with that. I think it should be, and yes, you can do that. <laughs> and I know it's illegal, but seriously, I think the clip should be built for a five-round capacity. Okay, Matt, it I'm going to hold. Be built for- Matt, I want to say thank you to you and everyone. Actually, again, be patient if you're trying to get through because we have lots of callers. I want to bring in our studio guest again, Solomon Friedman, a criminal defense lawyer in Ottawa. He specializes in firearms law. He's also a target shooter, a firearms advocate. And if I'm not mistaken, an ordained rabbi? That is true as well. <laughs> I don't know if that should be the last on that list or the first. <laughs> I don't know, but you're not. You're a pra- you, you didn't pursue the route. In I, the, I did the... not. I uh, chose another calling, that being uh, the criminal defense bar. It's quite a combination. <laughs> My parents think so. <laughs> well, and I think the audience is obviously interested in getting to know you, too. You've heard some of the callers. That's just to get some of the first reaction, too, because there's a lot of emotion embedded in this. Um is it fair to put this kind of, well, even, you know, this question, let's start with the question, you know, why own a military style weapon? Uh, what was your reaction when you hear it? Sure. I mean, and I think we heard from Jamie uh, that real fusion of emotion and in my respectful opinion, bad facts, that almost every fact that Jamie cited about that rifle is actually factually incorrect. This is our first caller. Our first caller, correct. And I can say that as an expert in this area, as somebody who spent a lot of time around these firearms, knows both the law and the technical specifications. The question you ask, why would anyone own a military-style assault rifle, is premised on two incorrect assumptions. The first one is that there's anything unique about a firearm being military style. Uh, If we go back through the history of almost every popular firearm in use in the world, it has its origins in military rifles for good reason. The the classic ubiquitous Canadian hunting rifle is the 303 Enfield. Canadian soldiers carried that with pride in World War I and World War II. Similarly, Almost every, even the Henry Lever action was made for the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s when soldiers got their hands on the Henry Lever action, which is sort of the most country or cowboy gun one can imagine. It was a military weapon. So military style simply means that it's been tried and tested in the field and used in some of the most adverse conditions in the world. So there's nothing in, wrong about that. So help me with language, because I did with my three sure. private conversations, anticipating this might come up. Like, how do you describe They are somewhat, they're light, they're sure. portable, there's the, they see them in movies. Um. I think before we go to the positive definition, we gotta, we got to weed out the other half of that definition, and that's assault rifle. Assault rifle is a technical term. It means a rifle that carries an intermediate cartridge, by the way, not a high-powered cartridge, not a low-powered, but an intermediate cartridge, and it is select fire, which means it is fully automatic. And that completely removes the AR-15 that we're talking about from the realm of assault rifles. These are not fully automatic. That fully automatic for the uh, less gun literate out there means you hold your finger on the trigger and rounds are expended until the clip is empty. That is not the case Why does this matter so much to, to people who own guns? Because to people who don't, it's still, the gun is designed to kill. Okay, aside from that, you are know, there people... firearms that are not designed to no, kill? No, that's the point. A so, car drives. It's n- it, it can kill people, but it's not designed for that. Well, so f- there's that. It, that's that moral implication always, whether you can fire quickly or not. For, so for some people, that it doesn't register. Well, I'll say this. I mean, in terms of whether or not it's designed to kill, uh, obviously firearms are used for a wide range of applications. Uh, the majority of them that don't involve killing, uh, whether it's Olympic style target shooting, whether it's competitive shooting, three gun competitions. They're used for many other uses. You heard a caller talk about plinking tin cans. Any uh, country kid can talk about that at length, um, as opposed to killing somebody. In fact, if you talk to every collector... That's more a byproduct. I mean, the gun wasn't designed for, for sure, shooting tin cans sure. in a field. And, and in fact, but you look at, you look at hunting in Canada. Um, hunting is not only legal in Canada, it is an enormous industry, and it's a great part of our heritage. This country was founded by fur trappers. This country was founded in many ways by the gun. As much as we want to distinguish ourselves from the Americans, and we're very different, we do not have a right to bear arms in Canada. The Supreme Court has said that firearms ownership in Canada is a well regulated regulated privilege, but it is part of our our culture. And sometimes, you're right, there is a great disconnect between people who hear and see these things as killing machines. That's another problem, that Hollywood has propagated this myth that you just spray in a room and every bad guy goes down because James Bond can do it. Okay, but so in the case of when when someone with your knowledge and you see what happened in Orlando, it wasn't precisely an AR-15, it was a Sig Saucer? A Sig Sauer MCX. I don't even know how to say it at all. But, I mean, for people on the outside, they feel like that 
that story is about spraying bullets right. and killing people. Right. And I, I think what we need to do is we need to look, and I'm, I'm as, a, as a criminal lawyer, as somebody who wants good public policy made, I look at the numbers and I want to look at the evidence. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is not, why should you own this object? The question is, why should this be restricted, right? We have many rights and liberties in this country, and we restrict our rights and liberties in a democracy. It's something we do all the time, but we do it on the basis of good public policy. So you have to ask yourself question number one. How many people are adversely affected by civilian ownership of the AR-15 in Canada? And I challenge anybody to point to any significant number of victims of the AR-15 in Canada. It's simply not a problem. Well, and, and to be fair, even our debate, I, I deliberately didn't go the direction of let's debate the petition that came up, because I do think it's there's this it's a philosophical thing, too, how people feel and their impressions of what it is. And and, and, and it, as you say, like your interest, of course, is you've even presented on Parliament Hill. Um, and we're asking about people who own it, like, you know, maybe the debates you're having in your own families, uh, the kind of things you're thinking about as you do see what unfolds um, south of the border. I can say one of the, the men I talked to said, you know, Four million people own the same guns as me, and I don't. It really makes me uncomfortable now. And Sandy Hook, in that case, was something that really changed kind of internally. I don't know. Have you thought about it differently too? I don't. Do yeah, you, have you own guns yourself? Or? Yeah, there's no question about this. These are the debates I've had. I mean, if you can imagine the the Friedman family Passover meal with my socialist parents uh, having a discussion about gun ownership in Canada. But I come back to the importance of facts over emotion. When you hear of a tragedy like this, when you hear of a Sandy Hook, when you hear of an Orlando. It hits you in the gut. There's no question about it. And, and, and right away, you want to do something about it. And unfortunately, our politicians feel that way too. They just want to do something about it. And more often, they want to be seen to be doing something about it. And I know as a criminal lawyer who defends, as you said, alleged gangsters, um, that crime and violence and gun violence has a complex set of causes. Okay, Poverty, mental health, addiction, alienation, marginalization, nothing having to do with the weapon of choice. Okay. Solomon Friedman, again, a criminal defense lawyer based in Ottawa. Let's go back to the phones. Sean, you're in Halliburton. Why own, I'm going to still say it in spite of notwithstanding the lawyer's, you know, uh, analysis, this kind of military, some people, even people who own them, call them military style rifles. Uh, do you have one? What? Do, how do you explain it? Well, you know, uh, there's a few points I'd like to make. Um, one is, is you know, although I am a gun owner, I don't actually have any problem with anyone who's against guns, providing that they've taken the time to learn about it. And I genuinely feel um, intellectually and emotionally, but just in fact, that a lot of people who are against guns haven't actually taken the time to learn about them or the people who fire them. Uh, people who enjoy the connoisseurship um, of guns, um, they're not the gung-ho crazies. There might be a few, but just like people who enjoy working on cars, they're not necessarily going to go street racing. A lot of the people who are into firearms enjoy the science, uh, the pensive quality of target shooting. Uh, they enjoy hunting. I enjoy all of them, and I also have to use it for protection because I live on a hill where there are actually bears that just go right past my cabin as well. Um, and I don't go out of my way to shoot them, but it's good to have uh, protection. Um, um, you know, I also used to live in uh, Cave Creek, Arizona, just down the road from what happened to be the largest civilian gun range in the world. And the interesting thing is, is you go there, you see people in wheelchairs enjoying the ability to uh, have a hobby. You see people of all kinds of different races and creeds and colors. You see a real sense of community. You see safety. You see Non-violence. Um, so that's a one point or a few I'd like to make. Sean, the other is... Can I is, ask you something, though? Just sure. What do you own? Because we are sort of trying to talk I about any of these weapons you use. I actually own a few... Uh, okay, I own a semi-automatic rifle that actually... Um, I have to tell you something. In, in the gun community, there is an aversion to telling people openly what you own, and there's a variety of reasons behind it. Uh, one is is because people who are into firearms don't want to be seen as bragging about. They don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. The other thing is is you have to be aware about safety, mm -hmm. and you don't want people who may be looking for a firearm to come for the firearm, even though um, you store them responsibly and safely. It's just, I guess, an etiquette thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I do own a semi semi-automatic gun that would be considered an historical battle rifle, for instance, 
I don't actually own an AR-15, and I'm getting to my main part here, main, main point. The, the reason is, is I would like to eventually own it. It's just not a priority. And part of that is what the civilian version of the AR-15 is, is truly, in many regards, it's a hobby rifle. And the reason that it is a hobby rifle is because in order to be able to manage that firearm militarily, which was full automatic with select fire, where you shoot off the first round and you don't get muzzle flipped so bad so that you the second one hits. Sean, I just... In other words, what they actually had to do is they had to dumb down the cartridge power to make it more manageable. That is why a lot of our hunting rifles that have evolved from, say, an M1 Garand, which is what you would call a thirty odd six, or an M14, which is like a three oh eight. Sean, can I just ask you, because I've got so many people on the lines and I really want to get in uh, as many callers. For you then, you said you don't want to own one because you, it's, you're not interested, actually. When you call it the, quote, dumbed down, it's not, it's not that interesting for you. It's so light. Okay. It's not practical uh, in many cases for larger animals. Um, I wouldn't really even use it to take a deer, generally speaking, unless I was very close to it. Okay. I have other priorities. I would enjoy an AR-15 from a hobby perspective of target shooting. Okay, or- I'm going to hold you there because uh, I need to get another caller at least in before the bottom of the clocks, but thank you. Uh, and I know that, again, there's so, so much to say. Nick, you're in Ottawa. I think you also have a perspective um, from a law enforcement background? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually spent uh, almost 10 years in law enforcement and and um, kind of that eventually transitioned over to being in the military. I'm in the military right now. So I've I've shot the Canadian version of, uh, like the military version of the AR-15 that we have here in Canada, actually several versions. Um, and I've, I've thought about getting one myself, uh, which would really be just for, for practicing my skills that, you know, and anybody who who goes shooting will tell you that there's you know you never get enough practice, but I'm very uneasy even even though I have you know now going on twenty years of training and experience with different types of firearms, I'm very uneasy with the idea of anyone really other than a hunter um having a gun at home um and one of the reasons is is that well what are your what's your training background because yes you know like the 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 lawyer you have on your panel mentioned. Um, it's not illegal, and um, there's a lot of things you have to do, and you have to prove that you have training and that you can store your firearm responsibly and everything. But really, what's your experience, right? Um, I visited a country in the past where literally walking down the street, people would have AR-15, civilians would have AR-15 slung on their shoulders. And I, after a little while of hesitation, I walked up to a person because they did speak English in that country, and I said, what do you have that? What, what, what do you need to, to you know... What do you need to have a, 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 an AR-15 just out in public? And they said, well, it's for my own protection. And I asked, well, from whom? And they said, well, from the terrorists. And they pointed literally to a little kid across the street. And I, and I kind of thought, well, this person needs an assault rifle or basically a rifle to protect themselves from a kid who, you know, the worst they can do is pick up a rock. Nick, um, and you've given quite a, well, cinema verite. We're walking with you, obviously, somewhere overseas. A quick comment from you, Solomon Friedman, as we head to our break. Well, I think firearms owners are subject to both licensing and background checks. We could discuss that more on the other end of the hour. Um, but these are people who have been pre-cleared and pre-screened as being safe and not prone to violence. And in fact, statistics show are much less likely to commit offenses than people without firearms licenses. Licenses. That for you is reassuring. It's tremendously reassuring. The numbers bear it out. And, uh, you know, emotion is one thing. Facts and evidence are another. All right. Uh, we are breaking away for some news and weather. Uh, Solomon Friedman, criminal defense lawyer based in Ottawa, also a target shooter himself. We're asking why own a military style assault weapon. one 877 8995 More when we come back. You're listening to Ontario Today. I'm Rita Chelly. In this hour, why own a military-style assault weapon? I think the AR has got a bad reputation because it looks like a military weapon. And in fact, it was originally designed to be a military weapon. While they may look scary, they pose no greater threat than any normal semi-automatic hunting rifle. Certainly no more powerful than a common hunting rifle or your grandfather's duck gun. Our guest, criminal defense lawyer, gun enthusiast, Solomon Friedman. He knows Canada's firearms laws inside and out. 
Do you own an AR-15 or something similar? Do you see anything but scary when you see one of these guns? Why own a military-style assault weapon? one 817 8995 Our Twitter handle is at CBC Ontario Today. Dave, you're next. You're in Toronto. How do you answer it? Hi there. Um, well, I just need my own experiences. I own a, an old Russian military rifle, and it's, it shoots a way more devastating round than the AR-15 does. And it, it's still sort of pinned to a five-round capacity, but it's got a wooden stock. It basically looks like sort of a, a, an AK-47, like the common terrorist gun. Mm-hmm. But, but nobody has ever said... You know that you know that that in, in a criminal's hand would be way more worrisome, in my opinion. And the only reason I bought that is because my my previous military rifle, which used to be my grandfather's 303, you know, the first World War, second World War rifle, they no longer make ammunition for it. The ones that they do make are really really expensive, and, and it's just a deer hunting rifle for me, or maybe go off to a target target practice at a, at, a, at a sandpit with some friends way up in northern Ontario. So how do you but, interpret some of the debate, and it's real, particularly in the U.S., but also here, that, you know, there is a, you know, this kind of the killing machine, quote-unquote, I'm using air quotes there, uh, that, you know, it's light, it's portable, it's too easy to get, it's being used in these these massacres uh, not that far from here? Well, I, I mean, I, I guess like, you know, like what a lot of other people have said already, that like every single rifle, every single gun is sort of an evolution of, of a military rifle. So it's, you know, to single that one out is, is uh, I don't know, like it looks like it's a scary gun because it, it, they predominantly are black. But yet I saw one on the Internet the other day. And it was all sort of anodized, a pink color, and, you know, like some little kid was using it. And all of a sudden it doesn't look like a scary gun, even though it is exactly the same as... So, you, you, you know, Dave, the, the point you're making is a good one, and it's about, you know, for example, you know, we look at what is the lethality of these of these firearms. And if you take the AR-15, and one of the measures of the power of a firearm is the kinetic energy, that is, how much force is it actually producing in that round that it's propelling? The AR-15 is less than a common thirty caliber hunting rifle, and it's a quarter of what a 12-gauge shotgun uh, can deliver. So I think a lot of this has to do with aesthetics. And in Canada, unfortunately, firearms are classified in prohibition prohibited, restricted, or non-restricted categories, not based on form and function, not based on lethality, but based on appearance. So you have certain firearms that, because they don't have a straight wood stock, um, are classified as restricted or prohibited when they are no more dangerous. Um, you know, what's important here, Dave, and you'll know this well, that when you apply for a firearms license in Canada, you know, we talk about whether or not these firearms are easy to get. So we have to start there. How do you get an AR-15 in Canada? You get one by entering an application process in which you have to provide far more intrusive information than a public servant who's getting secret security clearance to work for the government. Like what? You have to disclose things, for example, as to whether or not you've had criminal charges laid against you where you were acquitted or the charge was withdrawn. Imagine that. You're found innocent. You have to disclose that to the government. You have to tell them if you've had an emotional breakdown, if you've ever been treated for depression, alcohol, drug abuse, if you've lost your job in the past five years, if you've had a bankruptcy in the past five years. Is it fair to ask? Well, that's that's a, that's that's an interesting question. Does it actually help? The point is, the state of the law today requires that. So, to talk well, I'm about- asking because it it may actually be the reason, part of a reason that you've put out the, before that it's not in the hands of everyone, and that there seems to be stable use of it. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think the the background check we have in Canada is incredibly robust, and it's something that we should be proud of. We should be proud of the fact that in, in this country we do not have an epidemic of criminal misuse of firearms. Now, I would say from a research perspective, that has very little to do with our gun laws and has to do with our socioeconomic um, status in Canada. In other words, we don't have a history of 300 years of institutionalized racism that has given breed to gang violence, poverty, and addiction in the United States. You can't put the two together. You know, you, uh, you know it's interesting when we talk about numbers. We have almost 50 people killed in Orlando. In The month of June so far, there have been 50 people killed in gang, gun-related homicides in the city of Chicago. So mass killings draw attention, but statistically speaking, they are not the significant source of gun homicides in the United States. Toronto papers have talked about that because the city of Toronto, of course, feeling, uh, you know, feeling certainly a kind of heat and change in the increase in gun violence there. So uh, we are talking to all of Ontario, but some some, certainly some sensitivity uh, in that biggest urban core. Uh, John, you're next. You're calling us from Kitchener. Go right ahead. 
Hey, Rita, I just wanted to kind of address the fact that we're having this conversation and it's very rational and it's very reasonable and Solomon sounds like a really smart guy. The people who are tend to abuse the gun regulations, they're not so rational, they're not so reasonable. So to have more restrictions, I, I guess what I know is none of my hobbies are gonna kill people. You know, so for a civilian to have this, uh, so, like rifle, it's, it's it's ridiculous to my mind. Okay, so let, let's linger on here because you're you're a rare voice. Most people calling in obviously may disagree. But uh, have you ever owned a gun? No, no, not interested. No, no, guns kill people. You know, if John steals my soccer ball. I like soccer. It's not going to be in the wrong hands and and kill somebody. That gun, if it, if it ends up in anyone's wrong hands, or if someone can get through the background check by filling out all, like lying and t- saying whatever needs to be said to get a gun, they can kill somebody. You know, John, you, you, you raise an interesting question because we have to look at what's the other side of this debate. If you say, why do you own a rifle? The other side is, what should the law be? So, you know, if, if John, you may propose, for example, that these guns should be banned. They should be prohibited in Canada. There should be no legal way to get them. The question is, what possible expectation do you have that that would actually solve any of these gun-related problems? In Canada, cocaine is prohibited absolutely. You can't get it. doesn't matter if you have a license. doesn't matter if you have a background check. You can't get it. I and every other criminal defense lawyer in this city can tell you that drugs are widely available for anyone who wants them. Prohibition cannot address somebody who's willing to break the law. That's and in fact, a very if we, rational explanation. If we look at the sources of... Fewer e- guns are going to have fewer consequences. Unfortunately, the evidence does not bear that out because the evidence, sources... Ev- you mean, you, you, like, again, you're, you're having a very cerebral conversation here that doesn't help but do we want laws made on the basis of a cerebral discussion or made on the basis of a knee-jerk reaction when the auditor general of canada chemicals you're not allowed to spray your weeds in your in your garden because it could pose a problem a health problem an environmental problem this is a, this is a problem too that maybe maybe a ban is, is in order. Uh, that's interesting. The Auditor General Sheila Fraser in 2006 addressed this issue, and she looked at the entirety of the Canadian gun control scheme. And this should alarm people. She found that there was no proven beneficial association between the laws on the books and public safety outcomes. So that's a problem. We need to look inward and say, we want to do more than appear to be solving this problem. We actually want to solve this problem. Can I throw in something else? I want to ask you this, John, before I let you go. Um, uh, how about when you talk about the idea, you know, if you ban them all, um, you know, the only people would have them, I guess, in, in would be police officers, other kinds of authorities? And the criminals, uh, I'm sure, would lay them all down. Yeah, <laughs> farmers, <laughs> hunters, I, you know, I, I'm well, fine with uh, just much stricter regulations and no such thing as a as any kind of assault rifle. That's, that's preposterous. Well, it's good because assault rifles, as, as a matter of fact, assault rifles cannot be owned legally by, well, by citizens we're in talking Canada. talking about this AKAR. Yeah, no, no yeah, the reason I'm asking you, mass bullets, that's John, ridiculous. it's more the idea, if I can, just complete the thought. You know, if you, if you it, would you feel safer in a society where, let's say, only police authorities had guns and no one else yes 100 yes. percent. because you know Even there's somebody out there that, saying no way the criminals would have them absolutely <laughs> oh. knowing that criminals could still have them i would feel much safer yes oh, okay fair enough i want to ask the question because it's actually important i think and that's maybe a whole other debate because i know that a lot of people think no i mean if other people have them i want to have them like for some people it is a sense of protection well, I, I think we have to ask about you know when you talk about feeling safer so the the this crime statistics in canada are widely available most violent crimes in canada don't involve a firearm most homicides in canada Can you tell don't involve what the, a firearm what the weapon of choice is it's the weapon of choice is always a bladed weapon yeah uh less you're next in Orangeville. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, Hello. Um, my question becomes, if only police and governments have units or any kind of semi-automatic, um, isn't that something like, uh, you know, slaves have no guns? Uh, we then have no control of our own destiny. I'm more concerned about uh, if this is about killing or death, I have numerous semis, I've had ARs, all kinds. Not one has ever jumped off the wall and shot somebody, robbed a bank or anything like that. Uh, Been ex-military, no issues there. My big concern is if this is about killing or death, how come on a long weekend we can have 50, 60 people die and nobody cares? There's no big hoo-ha. People drink, 
alcohol, drive their cars. I've never heard, let's restrict cars, let's restrict uh, no eight cylinders, only four well, cylinders. You know, Les, we can... We, alcohol interrupter in every vehicle. Les, we if can take that even death. further. You know, we can take that even further. Cigarettes kill 100 people a day in this country. 800 people a year are killed by secondhand smoke alone. So no one's making a personal choice there. We have to decide how do we want to regulate dangerous objects in our society. And that's the question that we're all asking here. Everybody agrees that the AR-15, like any other firearm, can be misused and it can be dangerous. The trouble is that statistically speaking, it is not misused out of proportion to any other objects in society. But it does attract... In Canada. In, in, in Canada. It, just, it does appear different in the, in the U.S., Sure, Do you agree? and I think it is. Uh, but to me, actually, the, the evidence seems to suggest that it's not because of the prevalence of firearms, but it's because of the other, the other factors that create criminality. Um, and, and, you know, when our, lo- when our legislators look at addressing criminal law issues, often they want to prohibit or ban because they appear to be doing something successful. And really, addressing gang violence, you, you mentioned Toronto. Toronto's a great example. How do you keep a kid from joining a gang in the first place? That's the real question here. How do you make him value a college or university education over dealing drugs on the corner? The, the firearm violence is a symptom of that lifestyle. It's not the cause in and of itself. Harder to fix. It's a bigger, yeah. more abstract. It, it's expensive yeah. as well. So, you know, when firearms restrictions may appear to be beneficial, what actually is required is a lot of introspection, hard work, and money to solve these social problems. Zach, you're next. You're on the line in Mississauga. AR-15s, other similar weapons. Do you own one? Hi. uh, Thanks for having me on. Uh, No, I don't own one, but I'd like to try owning one. Um, Why? The only thing stopping me from having one is that I don't want to be forced to join a gun club. Because it's it's restricted. Okay. So let's talk through this. Why would you like one? Well, just because I want one. I'm curious about it. Um, the government already trusts me with uh, shotguns and rifles. I've passed the test. I've been vetted. I've you know, had the background check, uh, passed the exams. And I've got you know, other guns that are just as powerful, if not more so, than the AR-15. So I'd ask, why not? Okay. Um, but when you're talking about you have to join a gun club, explain that. Well, the fact that the AR-15 is restricted right now, that means that the only thing you can do with it is bring it home, and then bring it to the gun range, and then bring it home again. Whereas with rifles and shotguns, you have your license. You can buy those anytime you want, bring them home. You can take them out to the back 40 on the farm. You can take them to Crown Land and hunt uh, or do target practice or whatever you want with them. And, you know, we trust people to do that with rifles and shotguns. Why can't we trust them to do that with the AR-15? You know, I think that frustration. I think that frustration that we're hearing from Zach there is one that really resonates with, with gun owners. You say, I open up my safe. My 12-gauge shotgun, which is socially acceptable because it's just made of a wooden stock and a metal tube, is far more dangerous, can do far more harm. But those in power who are making these regulations don't look at it in a logical way. You know, Zach talked about the hoops he's had to jump through. People in the United States, there's a debate, should we have background checks, for example, at at, uh, gun shows or private sales? Uh, Many people don't know how often gun owners are subject to background checks in Canada. And the answer is every single day. Every name in the license database is run through a number of databases, not just criminal background checks and not just criminal records, but mental health, domestic violence, social services. These are people who are as vetted as any person can be. But so, um, Zach, you know, to go back to when you're describing, you know, you have these, they're okay, uh, and you'd like one, but, you know, that you're talking about the hoops. You know, for a lot of people uh, who don't own guns, and we had a few callers get through, when they hear that, it's not comforting to them, I guess. Like, even the fact that... I mean, if they were truly honest, they actually don't like guns. People don't like them, right? So whether it's this one or another one, I think that's where it gets murkier. For you, um, just even about storage, um, can you talk about that? Like if you had a gun that you just need to go to the target range with, couldn't you just use a gun that was stored at the target range? Like what would it matter if you owned it or not? Um, that You're talking about something a little bit different, uh, central storage. Um, the AR-15s that Canadians own right now, they keep them at home, and they're trusted to keep them at home and, and not take them outside and use them. Uh, they're trusted to uh, follow the terms of their license and authorization to transport that says they can only bring them to certain places. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it's really not so much about this gun or that gun. It's about who has it. And right now in Canada, the people are checked, and they've already got shotguns and rifles, and, you know, for that matter, they already have AR-15s at home. And they're already trusted to use those safely and responsibly. Mm-hmm. So to you know take 
this gun or that gun and pick it out and say that one is suspicious, especially evil. I think it's just a waste of time. And it's interesting, the issue of central storage, right? And that's one that comes up, you know, why not store these guns at a gun range? So first of all, the Department of Justice has done a study in which they did, they looked at burglary rates among firearms owners, and they determined that firearms owners are no more likely to be burglarized than anybody else, uh, notwithstanding the fact they may own firearms. In, in, in my view, if we look at where there are gun burglaries, they often happen actually at gun stores. And there could be no worse idea for giving a central location of privately owned firearms at a gun range or elsewhere, which would not be under the constant supervision that a personal residence would be under, uh, which would be much easier easier to burglarize. I think that actually is a recipe for putting guns in the wrong hands, as opposed to keeping them out of the wrong hands, which is what, you know, law-abiding gun owners like Zach want to do. Michelle, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Coldwater, Ontario. Oh, okay. Um, the, uh, do you have an AR-15? Ever shot one? Yes, I've, I've shot an AR-15 quite a few times, and actually I own one. Okay. Um, tell us about it. Okay. Well, first of all, um, as I was, I was talking to Gal on the phone, and I believe it's been mentioned before, is that originally, you know, it was a Colt sportsman it's designed for hunting. But I'm a woman, and in a lot of cases, and I'm sure Solomon will tell you that um, women are tinier, we have a smaller stature, we have a different, uh, you know, length of pull, etc. And the AR is a very light gun. I do target shooting, and, it, um, and also it's a semi-automatic, which has a lot less recoil. Um, which is, um, as a woman, again, uh, wonderful for being able to shoot. It, it's a great tool to be able to use. Um, I would love if it was reclassified as um, as non-restricted so that it actually could be used for hunting. And again, uh, my hunting rifles and my shotgun um, are a lot more powerful than um, than the AR. I think it's just it's a black thing that looks looks really scary um, to to some who don't who don't have um, a lot of firearms knowledge. So um, again, some of this uh, is grafted on obviously into what is happening in the U.S. And our, our guest in the studio has pointed out a number of times the different societal issues, perhaps. But you know, as an owner of an AR-15, um, mm-hmm. do you do you have you reflected at all when you hear you know about a, a shooting like Sandy Hook? I mean, is there any level of you know what goes through your mind as someone who actually owns one? No, it it doesn't make me um, question my my decision about ownership. Um, I'm a responsible person. I'm law-abiding. You could take any gun and in the wrong hand, it could be dangerous. But we are so regulated here, as Solomon pointed out, about the number of times that, you know, we're checked and checked and rechecked. And, uh, no, it doesn't make me question my decision of ownership whatsoever. In fact, um, once a year, I volunteer as a, um, as a range safety officer um, at, a range, uh, at a range where it's a whole women's day, and half the day the women are introduced to AR-15s and um, get comfortable shooting them. Hmm. Okay, Michelle, thank you for your call as well. Guy, you're next. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Markham. Okay, go right ahead. Do you own one? Would no. like to? Never want one? No, no. I, I, when I, I called in because I wanted to know why we're asking this question today. Um, this is, for me, this is a, um, a big issue. I'm a gay man. Orlando touched me personally. It was, uh, it, it happened in the United States. It didn't happen here. We, as far as I know, don't have a problem with this kind of mass uh, shooting. I know we've had one in the past, but to th- why are we talking about this today? That was my question. Why not? Oh. I mean, <laughs> the guns exist. I mean, it's all to turn it back. I mean, uh, there is a petition, 25,000 names presented in Parliament to make this firearm and uh, a non-restricted firearm in Canada. So that's... Enough of a reason? No, no I, think, I think that's actually a, a very I, fair question. 
You know, uh, it, uh, and gun owners themselves are probably listening to this program and they're asking themselves, why are we talking about this? There are yeah, two million. Are there are today? two million licensed gun owners in Canada. There are half a million who are licensed to own an AR-15, and they all look in their gun safes and they say, it's never jumped off the wall. It's never done anything wrong. Everybody I know who owns one uses it responsibly. This is not an issue uh, that we have in Canada now. Why is there a petition to make it non-restricted? That's that, that's a good question, and I think it goes back to what Michelle was talking about. She was talking about the physical characteristics of the AR-15. It's light, it's ergonomic, it's adjustable. It's a very ideal small game hunting rifle, and it's used by numbers vary between three and five million people in the United States for that purpose. So, you know, it's a good discussion to have, but. There are many gun owners who ask themselves, what's the problem? What what harm? Well, you know, because gun owners get to talk to non-gun owners. That's the thing about the phone-in. You don't just hang out with the people you know and agree with all your values. Oh, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. This is a fantastic discussion. I'm I'm happy to be part of it. Uh, uh, I think I'm still here. Yeah, you're you're on the (laughs) air, guys. You certainly are. Why why are we talking about this today? Well, uh, There are are so many things that we could be talking about, so many issues which we, we could be discussing. Uh, it seems it seems that it's uh, it's it particularly contentious today because of the weapon used in Orlando, and uh, uh, this this resurrects uh, all the feelings that I had, uh, you know, when uh, when the issue when the the shooting happened uh, for the for the week afterwards. Uh, I don't know anyone who died. I don't I. I haven't been to the United States in a long time. Okay. But uh, to this is more than an issue about guns. Absolutely. And Guy, and in fairness to our issue. program, we we opened up the phone lines the day of. We had Rob Oliphant here, who you may know is an openly gay MP who is elected by the largest Muslim community. And uh, I hear you. We're planning things to go into Pride. Um, we do feel uh, uh, every day. Um, so I, I don't want to get go on too long about that. But you, you've had your say on that, at least. And I do hope that in the net effect that there is public value. And I'll assert that, yes, in, in what we try to do every day is that this is a very broad community. You you hear people, whether you agree with them or not, um, that actually isn't the point. <laughs> then you can decide which community you align yourself with. You hear from people who you may not walk with every day. It may sometimes even change the way you think. I know that happens. I hear it sometimes on the air. I certainly hear uh, in emails afterwards that we get um, on any variety of programs. So, Andrew, uh, you're calling us from Ottawa. I yep. will repeat this contentious question. Why own a military-style assault weapon, this AR-15 or similar versions? Yeah. Um, I'd like to actually deal with the, the question you're actually asking, because it seems that the show is, has come, become a gun control kind of thing. Um, the Armalite rifle, Model 15, was introduced by Colt in 1959, so like 57 years ago, and was not popular like for the first 25 years. But it seems the consumer preference for like black car, car dashboards, stereo components, and firearms all started like in the mid-1980s. It seems the reason many people choose a black, metallic, and plastic semi-automatic rifle over a functional identical oak and stainless steel semi-automatic rifle might be the same reason that most people now buy black stereo components instead of functionally identical oak stereo components. It's about style. So why would someone want to own a military-style assault rifle? Um, Style, right? That's it. Um, and it's just you, about style. Did you? You seem to know something of it. Did you target shoot or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Have, I target shoot. I have an AR-15. I have an AR-10. Uh, I have a number of different uh, firearms. But it's the style, right? That's what that's what's at issue here. Um, because like, we look at the firearm that was used to ambush the Mounties in Moncton. That was an actual World War II battle rifle. Mm-hmm. But there was no real because it was straight stock wood everything. You know, same capacity uh, in Canada as an AR-15. Same Solomon firing Friedman? rate, yeah. bigger thing. There was no, ba- there was no big public outcry to ban battle rifles. Right, and, and Andrew, ra- you know, raises a very interesting point here when we talk about style. So, what does style matter? The problem is, and I can tell you this as a criminal lawyer, the style of the AR-15 that's led it to be restricted has tremendous criminal law consequences for individuals. Uh, gun owners who fall shy on their paperwork, forget to renew their license, or, for example, uh, don't get an authorization to transport. They have all their other paperwork, but are missing that one form. If it's a restricted firearm, 
you are facing years in the penitentiary. As opposed to if it was just a wood-stocked firearm, a non-restricted firearm, the, the sentences, the penalties are much less. And how many of these, I mean, you gave us examples, I think, to our producer mm. beforehand, like there are gun, these, these guns that are almost identical, but are uh, uh, classified totally differently. Do you want to share that with the audience? Sure, absolutely. Um, if, if I showed your average citizen on the street a Robinson Arms XCR, they'd say, that's an M16 or an AR-15. That gun is classified non-restricted in Canada. If I showed them an AR-15, that's restricted. And if I showed them a Daewoo K2, that's a South Korean sort of uh, knockoff of an AR-15, they'd say, that's an AR-15. And that gun's prohibited, absolutely uh, prohibited. You have to be grandfathered to own it, and even higher penalties uh, can apply. So what people want, and I think what the petition in Parliament spoke to, was whether or not you want these firearms classified restricted, non-restricted, or prohibited. Everybody on any side of the debate should agree we want logical consistency. We want classification done on an, in an evidence-based manner, based on function, based on lethality, not based on simple style. Melissa, you're in Thunder Bay. We're almost running out of time. If you can be succinct, tell us about yourself and why you called today. I call because I'm a, a competitive sports shooter, and um, you know, it, it's this is a tool, it's a sport, a piece of sporting equipment that we use for our sport. Um, and participate in three gun and, and different types of shooting competitions and target shooting, and it's something that's enjoyable. It's not, you know, for me, it's analogous to when I go and join my hockey league or my playing. It's recreational on the weekends, but this is the appropriate um, piece of equipment for the, for that sport. And I understand where it's coming from because I used to be, um, you know, against firearms ownership. I actually became involved in shooting and hunting because I was interested in the local food and slow food movement and I wanted to get my firearms license and learn how to hunt and through that I became involved in my local gun club and local ranges and it became exposed to handguns and, and later on to the AR-15 rifles and sports shooting and other types of shooting as well and you know shooting is um, it can be a very relaxing uh, zen activity it's fun it's a way to socialize um, and I think that there's just a lack of education and knowledge around firearms in Ontario I think I was raised you know in the last 30 years in a time when Canada has been very um, anti-firearm and it's not um, not well understood. And so I had a lot of fear about it until I actually got to investigate those um, those activities. In the Melissa, firearms. thank you for your call. I have to hold you there. A quick final word for you, Solomon Friedman. You've been nodding as Melissa's talking. I think that's what we hear, that when people who are, who are not familiar with firearms are exposed to firearms and start to learn about the laws and the actual facts and we stop, you know, using terms like assault rifle or killing capacity and you actually learn about what these objects are, how they work and how they're used, then your perspective changes. And I think, you know, this has been a fantastic discussion because it was based in the facts. Solomon Friedman, thank you for coming in. He's a partner with Edelson Clifford D'Angelo Friedman, based in Ottawa. I said at the beginning, I hope we could close some of the distance between the two sides. Thanks for your company. Bye-bye.